What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 94 of the Rudest Wrestling Podcast. Man, we are almost 200. Who thought we'd make it here? Um, it's crazy. That went by fast, didn't it? It went by very fast. Hey, <laughs> um, I just got my my shoes. I'm pumped. I think they're sweet. Um, I, I love the... Obviously, so I'm, I'm very biased to red and black because that's AWA colors and my shorts and my shirt are generally red and black, uh, possibly a little gray. So I want, I was like that they match. So I think they match just perfectly with AWA colors. I know you guys didn't design them with that in mind, but they, they look really nice with AWA gear. And then even my wife commented on, you know, and I think it's funny about how nice the packaging is. Um, that's like the nicest packaging ever for a wrestling shoe. So, uh, a Isn't it cool? I mean, it's, 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 it's probably rare that you get excited about, about a shoebox, right? But it's actually, uh, the, yeah. Not not only is it just the way it's constructed and the way you open it, but inside every, you know, I don't want to give away what what the box is for those of you who haven't received these the shoes yet. But yeah, I mean, we put just in the in the box itself, we put a lot of thought into that. You know, um, it turned out yeah. pretty cool. They're they're slick. So yeah, so I got so, got my new shoes. I have I've not even worn them yet. Obviously, I, have, I do have a pair of the new Snyders that you guys gave me a prototype of that I've been wearing for I don't know five five months now or so. But I have not worn my new shoes. But I'm excited, excited to throw them on uh, and scrap them a little bit. So what's your overall thoughts? I mean, I mean you you're more in tune with what we the, the changes we made this year. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, but, I you listen. I'll tell you, I was. Uh, you know, I, I thought the first Schneider was the nicest shoe I put on. Um, and obviously, I you know, I hear that you guys had um, a few issues with both the sizing and the durability. But I never had those. Like, I didn't I didn't experience those same issues. I can't commiserate with those because uh, the, the couple pairs of those I had, they were damn near perfect for me. Um, the, the new shoes are, are equally as nice. I, I love them both. But, you know, for, for me... I'm still wearing my my uh, first version Snyder's too. They they've lasted me perfectly for like a y- a year and a half. So um, the new ones uh, feel really uh, oh man, I'm blanking on the other shoe they feel like. But there's another shoe they feel like they're, they're similar, uh, except for that that fabric and that material's uh, really super nice. Yeah. So overall, I mean, I think the 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 response initially has been really good. You know, I'm we're excited. I mean, I I think when you you've been in it in been building on the shoe and working on the shoe and you you know you see the steps along the way and the, just the minor adjustments you make you it's almost like you get you lose a little context when when you're yeah. when you're in the mix and, and doing things so it's it's nice to hear really objective opinion even though you're biased to us i i get it and i appreciate <laughs> that but uh it i know you're going to give you real feedback and you know it, yes, it seems like the the evolution of the shoe you know, we we've, we've made some really positive strides, and uh, the initial response is is really good. We've get pretty pretty much got all the shoes in stock, so everybody that's been ordering, um, hopefully, those pre orders and the initial orders, you know, we're all up to speed. Everybody's getting getting in their shoes, and yeah, so nice. wrestling that's wrestling fantastic. shoes is right around the corner. So if you you need them, we got them. Perfect. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's get into the college stuff then. Yeah, speaking of college stuff, um, so since we're we're jumping into the heart of season, you know, the one thing that I think a lot of people are familiar with, but not, some people may not be, especially when they're looking for school specific gears. We we do have thirteen licenses for D one programs, ranging nice. from Ohio State, Oki State. I um, think you guys should dump the Oklahoma State one, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's just, that's just that's just my own personal biases. Yeah. But we do. I mean, we have Lehigh, we have Rutgers, we have Nebraska, we have Northern you, Iowa. You have you have Missouri, Missouri, Missouri. I don't so believe we, you have Wisconsin got, though. I don't believe you have we Wisconsin don't. yet. Hopefully, <clears throat> eventually. Yeah, I mean, we're we're in the in the midst of we're constantly applying for applications to to get licenses granted, but it's not. It's a li- little easier said than done done at times, especially when you're working with huge huge. Um, brands, huge institutions going through that licensing process. But, you know, I think a lot of college fans, it's easy to get, it's easy to get college merchandise. It's not so easy to get college wrestling merchandise. So, you know, that's one of those things. If you're looking for sports specific, Lehigh wrestling, Okie State wrestling, Virginia Tech wrestling, Oklahoma wrestling, we do have, we do offer a number of items and a, a number of new 
new items this year. So they nice. we just got those into stock. We're three weeks out from wrestling season, the college wrestling season. So it's a perfect time to to get those get those items. I am only allowed to wear Missouri and or Wisconsin, so I will not be wearing anything else. <clears throat> but uh, you know, everyone else is welcome to wear wherever what they want. Although uh, you know, I don't harass my kids for anything wearing anything at AWA except Oklahoma State stuff. They wear too much Oklahoma State stuff. I will harass them a little bit about that. Why? Why do you harass them? I thought you and John were tight. I like John Smith, but dog, I got I got eight losses in college. <laughs> Seven were, were the same guy from the same school. So that's just still like, yeah, let's. You know what? I'm. You know, I don't like harbor any grudges, but I'm like, I don't want to see that every day. Like, come on, guys, I just don't want to see it. it. Get, Where's something else? Yeah, it's fair, right? <laughs> I just don't want it in my face. So do any of your guys just do it to poke you? Oh bit? yeah, oh yeah, uh, multiple. We have multiple of them that they 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 um, you know, they they wear it on a very regular basis, and and it, it you know, I think they do it just to harass me specifically. Hopefully, we'll get to one seventy four through one fifty seven today. Well, Matt, I thought you know what? I really thought that Zahid was going to stay at seventy four, and I did. I have not ever seen. Um, a rival quite like Zahid Mark where they were all such high finishes all four years, right? Because it was one in three, one in two, one in two, and then, right, they haven't been seniors yet. But, I mean, that's really, realistically, insanely high finishes. So, Zahid's bumping up. We talked about that already. Um, and then Miles Amin is taking a little bit redshirt. He's been the other one that's been close with Mark Hall. So, Mark Hall, I think, maybe takes a uh, – a deep breath of fresh air because he doesn't have quite as many people pushing him um, as he previously had. Not only that, but just like you said, you 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 take Valencia out of the equation, you take Miles Amin out of the equation. Now all of a sudden, like this is a pretty wide open weight class. Yeah, I mean, past there's not a lot one, of right. Yeah, there's not a lot of depth. I mean, there's there's quality. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of quality well, I, in this weight class, no, but. I'll, Listen, you don't you don't have to be so nice. I mean, there's not a lot of guys in this weight class who have previously had high level success. Mark Hall, who's number one, um, Amin is still in, in the rankings. I'm looking at right now, but he, he's out, right? He's a little bit graduating. Cutler has been an All American. Kemmer has been All American. Labriola has been. Joseph Smith has been. But of all of those guys, none of them have been high All Americans. None of them have been two, three, or four. I don't. I don't and none of the none of those All Americans were at. None of those placements were at 174 either, correct? Oh, Ke- uh, Kemmer, no, La- Kemmer Labriola. Was, Labriola was yes. I'm, yes. I was yeah. My bad. Yeah. Yes, Labriola placed. But yeah, you're at you're right. Year, but Kemmer, Kemmer down at 57. Last time we saw yeah. Kemmer was at 57. Well, did Color place this, 57? No, Color did not place at 57. No, right. That, that was the earnest weight. Yeah, and then I guess it's it's. It's interesting when we're talking about the depth in, in this, where you've got at six and seven, you've got Joe Smith from Okie State, Connor Flynn at Missouri, and they were previously ranked 12 and 13 at 165, but they're yes. six and seven at 174. So that that in and of itself, you know, speaks to you yeah. know, the depth in this weight class as well. I, and I, I think totally... it's 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 interesting that typically yeah, for all I, I guess another another way to highlight that, you know, the rankings that, you know, Kemmer, Smith, and Flynn. I mean, they're all ranked in the top eight, and they're you know, Kemmer's been out for a year. I think he's yes. a bit of an un, unknown at this point, jumping up Joe, two weight classes, being out. Joe out, out Smith. Yeah. Joe Smith's a disaster at the end of last year. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to dig into that to get, to get your thoughts. I'm interested to see. Now that it's stabilized, it seemed like last year there was a lot of uncertainty around 65, 74 with Oki State. And I don't know if that, you know, led to some uneven results for, for Joe. Well, he, um, I mean, Joe, Joe had a year. great start at 174, but then at 165, he was not not even close to as effective. I remember we talked about that. And because he didn't wrestle any matches at 174, or at 165, when he went down there, he was unseated. He ended up being like, I don't know, was it 32 seed at Nationals or something? Something yeah. totally, totally ridiculous. Um, yeah, so I think you know he could be good, and he, you know he did kind of push Mark Hall last year at the scuffle till till the very end of the match. So you know I think he's a guy when you're looking at this list of who could maybe move up. Joe, Joe Smith is one of those. But then if, if you said if you told me 
Same time, Joe Smith did an All American. Well, I'm I'm also not all that shocked that he did an All American. So yeah. you know, one of those guys that could go kind of all over the board. The other guy that's uh, that's here that could kind of go all over the board, um, Anthony Valencia. You know, he's the guy that puzzles me because he's had such great freestyle results. I mean, all all the way back from when he was a senior in high school and he beat NCAA champions, and then he still has not. Um, he still has not been able to put together an all-American campaign in, in folk style at the Division One level. So uh, I guess we'll see what happens with him. But he, so I guess he's another huge wild card in this mix for me. Yeah, I mean, when you when you look at Valencia, I mean, he came out with such acclaim out of high school. He and he was he had such dynamic results on the freestyle scene, and he didn't have that you know that same level of success his first two years. But you wonder, like coming out of high school, he was he was ready to go. I he was he was it. rated above Zahid. Right. Yeah. And so it was interesting. I get why he redshirted, but I don't know. I, I would like to hear your thoughts on what do you think he needed to address during his redshirt year and or if that I was mean, even if you could even accomplish that. Well, he, he's one of those guys that uh it just puzzled, man. Some of these guys puzzle me because, you know, some guys, it's uh, the freestyle, the folk style difference is obvious. Oh, this guy's a great leg rider. Okay, well, well, no crap. He can't do freestyle. He can't leg ride in freestyle, right? Um, this guy ha- is a great scrambler, say Jesse Delgado. Okay, well, that's obvious. That, that one doesn't cross over at all, right? But right. with Anthony Valencia, I, I mean... I don't feel he's a strong mat wrestler in either, in either style, freestyle or folk style. Um, I I don't think he scrambles a gigantic amount, so that that shouldn't be a factor. He doesn't use a huge amount of dumps or that kind of thing. Um, he's pretty much just a takedown guy, and so when you know when he de- when he's as good as he is in freestyle, and then it doesn't really translate what's over to folk style that. Um, yeah, so uh, some of these guys, I just scratch my head and I figure it, it must just be some kind of uh, an internal mental block uh, that he's putting on himself why he can't cross over and have that same success. Yeah, to your point, I mean, he's got the transferable skills. Like, it should translate, right? Yeah. The success he was having was primarily on his leg attacks, getting to his double, right? And we've seen a ton of guys, like, yeah, I mean, have, you know, replicable results using the same skill set you know, because he, to your point, he doesn't have a high level of proficiency in folk style or freestyle in parterre yes. or on top. Uh, and so I don't know, I don't know necessarily, maybe they address top and bottom. Maybe, maybe that was the focal point of his, his redshirt year. And maybe that's why we didn't see him wrestle a ton of freestyle during his redshirt year either. Maybe it was really concentrating on some skill sets specifically within within folk style and maybe it's it's top specifically i don't know yeah i don't know it's, i, I it's always, always you know what i always thought i always thought maybe the weight cutting was an issue but i have been told repeatedly that that is not correct and weight cutting was never an issue at 165 um and he's, he's up at 174 so i guess we'll see if that makes a difference too one of the other things the last thing i want to i want to mention here at this weight class bit that I, I noticed that's fascinating is we're talking about this is a we just say it, it's a little bit of a weaker weight class that just it just is. Um, there's not a lot of guys who've had the same amount of success previously. Guys moved out of this weight class, um, but nevertheless, 11 of the top 12 guys in this weight class are seniors. You got to think that it is impossible. There's no way that will still be the case um, in come March. It's impossible. Mm. It's got to be impossible, right? Yeah, 11 of 12 seniors. That's like what? What the heck is going on here? That never yeah, happened. And one of those, yeah, and one of those seniors is all the way down at 14. Brandon Womack placed, oh. what, two years ago at 165? So it'll be interesting he, he, to see. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, I, 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 he's obviously a very talented kid coming out of high school. And when he went on his run a couple years ago at 165, I don't think it shocked people, but I don't think it was one of those – those picks that people were, were making. But when he did place, you're like, oh, this this guy finally found his breakthrough. And then he's had some uneven results, to, you know, after that. So it's for me, it'll be interesting to see what, what he does um, this year. Yeah, I, I guess I agree. You, can, you know, 
174 with at 13 with Ethan Smith. I think they're that'll be in, interesting to see how things play out in Ohio State's room. I think there's a lot of discussion going on with with some of their true fre- not only true freshmen but but redshirt freshmen with uh, Carson Karchla. Um, he's not he's not wrestling though. No. Uh, Listen, I'll just that, I'll just tell you, I was in Columbus one time, man. I know you're there all the time, and I heard under no circumstances will Carson Carson wrestle. That that is what I heard, uh, and I and I've heard that repeated other places. So, uh, but I would tell you what, I worked out with him. He was really really freaking good. So, um, and I would yeah. I would caution anybody to talk in absolutes about. <laughs> This what? guy in a red shirt. This guy, right? I, I'm not saying this. I'm not. I'm not trying to create a rumor. I'm just saying. Well, let's create a rumor. I, I'll create. Saying, I'll, I'll create a rumor, Matt. If Carson Carson wrestled, when I look at this field, um, he's going to do well. He's going. I think gonna he's going to really play. well. I, I think he's going to place pretty high. That's what my my gut tells me when I look at this list. Is that uh, wow? He's really good. I, I think he's going to would have some success. So who knows? Maybe they hold him back. Obviously, he's a guy um, who in, 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 you know we talk about that freestyle folk style gap. Uh, he wrestled freestyle. Who's number one two years ago? I I have never seen him with my own eyes in a high level folk style match. Um, and in freestyle, his gut wrench is probably the best in the country for the age level. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know that his success crosses over. I know when I wrestled him, he was really good, but we did not. We also did not do any mat wrestling, so I can't. I can't right. speak specifically on uh, what his mat wrestling skills were. I mean, it, so. for me, it's just there. There's a logical conversation, especially if you you've already come out and said Kirkley Avet is going to wrestle. You've got you know Rocky Jordan coming off red shirt. Well, what um, way is Rocky Jordan going to go? I think Rocky's probably going to go. I think that's 65? that's kind of up in the air, seventy four or eighty four, well, possibly. Well, eighty four. Well, where's Gavin Hoffman going to go? Well, I think there. I think there's a lot of discussion. I think there. I've heard. I've heard discussions that Ethan Smith possibly might go down to sixty five. Wow. So they, and, and that would that would push Caleb Romero out of the lineup. I mean, you know, Caleb Romero and uh, Ohio State's at the point where they need all Americans, right? And these guys are not ranked. Right. Um, super close to that mark. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to move around and, and to get the best guys in line. I did not realize Rocky Jordan was that big. I thought he was more like a 65, maybe a 74 pounder. I didn't no, he's, he's pretty big. I think his natural weight's probably 74 right now. Okay. I think he could. I mean, if 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 he was the man or he could be the man at 84 if they needed okay. to be. Um, so, yeah, um, we'll, we'll see where that is. But I think there's a lot of – not uncertainty, uncertainty yes. in, in to the extent like they have a lot of talented guys from 165 to, to 184. Like, and how is that, this going to shuffle out for, for their team? So, fair enough. It's not a bad problem. I'm not saying Ohio State has a bad problem. They have it. They actually have good problems. They're like, okay, yes. what's going to be the best option? What's going to be the ba- uh, best situation? You know, to place these guys in the lineup. So, I think we'll probably get a better idea about that in the next couple of weeks we should be seeing a lot of wrestle offs um Ooh, throughout the country college and I season think things are gonna, yeah i think things I are going to shore up pretty pretty quickly i love it i love it okay um well uh, do you want to do picks finalist picks i'll, I'll go mark yeah. hall over uh camera i think camera is gonna make a big jump that's my prediction and i'm gonna go with mark hall and mikey labriola Hey, has uh, I believe I know the answer to this, to, uh, uh, Matt? Has anyone ever been one two two one? Was wasn't was Daryl Burley one two two one? There, there has been guys been. Let Are me you look sure? That up. I'm, I know, I know. So, want to hear a funny story, Matt? Um, Doc Bennett. When I was in high school, remember Doc Bennett? Yeah, I'm actually going to visit Doc next week. Awesome. Okay, Doc Bennett yeah. took us all to. A, we were out at one of the like. Um, I don't remember what it was called at that point. Like it was like junior level training camps at the big training center and you're all trapped on campus. And so one night he uh, took us all to the movies and you know, he said, I can't remember what it was. It was like trivia. And if you, you win, he buys your movie ticket or, or something to that effect. And the trivia question was that, so that this is 2001 or yeah, 2001, I believe maybe possibly two. Um, and he says, you know, name the nine at the, at, so at that point, nine, NCA four-time finalists. 
Can you name them, Matt? So there, at that point, there was nine. Mm-hmm. Now, now I believe there's 16. Nine four-timers. As of, as, as of 2001. So, so Kale would be included. I think this is when Kale was, I believe Kale was a, a four-timer that year. So whatever, whatever year that was. Okay, sorry, I was a little distracted. I was looking for one, two, two, one finishes. So what was it? What was it since? Well, now, now you're cheating. You might be Google. No, prior to that, prior, he asked the question in that year. So Kale, Kale, Kale was included in that. Um, so four, four time NCAA finalists prior to 2002. Okay, so that would be. Let's go, Matt. Pressure's Gold, on right Gold, now. Goldman. Twin Goldman. Two, 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 one. I remember that. Bannock? Bannock was, yep, I believe he was three three time titleist. I think one two one one two one, I believe. Lost to Mark Schultz. Yep. Mark Schultz. Um who else? I would got? say obviously Pat Smith, right? Pat That's Smith. In Pat, there. Yep. Pat Smith and Kale. So we got you got uh Pat four four of the nine right now. There four I'll tell you there's the there's there's one really ancient one that uh, I did not know. Now I know it, obviously, but at that time I did not know it. Ancient. What? What? Give me ancient. the give me the decade because I'm kind uh, of. It's like, it's like the end of the. It's like, it's like the I'm, end of the end of the forties, Matt. Because then there was well, that there was that how, time how period. It? There was that time period after that where there you could only wrestle three varsity years. Okay, for, so for like, prior to that, I I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yes. I I so, knew. I thought it was always like that, but no. Was it? Would so, it be? Is it? It's not Utaki. No, it's um, a guy named. It's a guy named Dick Hutton. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So that's a little where did he, fun where, fact. Where did he wrestle? I believe Oklahoma State. Uh, I will if if I had a guess, I was either going to say Oklahoma or Okie State, yeah. you know, yeah. in, in that era, right? Yep. Okay. So that takes us up to five. So we have four four left. Yep. Oklahoma State University. Mm-hmm. Okay. Lee Kemp. Lee Kemp, right? Lee Kemp. Yep. So he's two, one, one, one. That's six. Uh, now, I don't know if I remember them all. Well, there's Gable. the one that's no Gable's not Gable had three. He that's Gable right, only had three possibilities. Right. Yeah, that's right. He only had three chances. Mm-hmm. Chorella? no, nope, not Chorella. Not Chorella. Was a three timer though, right? Uh correct. Chorella was a three time NCAA champion. Yes. Uh huh. Would it be Mike Caruso? Uh, I don't. I do not believe Mike Caruso is on there. He was a three timer. I'm trying to. So okay, ready, ready for who you missed? You missed okay, one, yeah. one, one that Rudis makes T-shirts of. So I'm very disappointed in that, Matt. I'm Lincoln, disappointed in myself. Lincoln McElroy. Yes, come on. One, one, two, one, one. Um, and then the one I'm thinking of, who I, I'm going to go back. Actually, I found a website. Daryl Burley, I believe, is one, two, two, one, which will be the only other person besides if Mark uh, uh, Mark Hall wins it this year, he'll be one, two, two, one. Uh, who's the other guy okay. we're missing? Um, Dwayne Goldman, we got him. Dwayne Goldman was the only person ever to do three seconds and then a first, which uh, that that would be that would have been a stressful situation. Daryl, yep, Daryl Burley, class of nineteen eighty three, one two two one. Ed Bannock, one one two one. Oh my goodness, man, I cannot find him. Randy, so Randy Lewis probably would have been had he not get hurt because he was two one one and they took seventh his last year. Mark Chuel was three one one one. You got Lee Kemp. Oh, here's who you missed. And he is he's opposite me, Matt. He's one one two two. Pat Milkovich. Huh. Okay. He's from Ohio. Yeah, he's an I, Ohio guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, I, I did not get that one. Pat Milkovich. He's he's one that <coughs> is hard to remember. Um I need to I need to brush up on my history. I'm disappointed uh, in myself. N- now I'm there's a, pretty good at that stuff. Now there's a bunch more. So obviously there there was Kale. Um then I, I think I might have been next on the list. Let's see. Kale. No, I'm sorry. Mako. Mako did it. Then I did it. Then I believe Varner is the next one on there. Um, yep. yep. Varner's on the list. And then now you've had Taylor. D- Dake, Steber, Taylor. And I think you've had so many guys that were really close, like Andrew Howe, second, first, third, second. Ed Ruth, obviously, third, first, first, first. Um, is that Steber? Let's see if we got anyone else. Nope, that's it. Okay, so we're done with that. Gabe Dean, third, first, first, second. That's close. So who's on the cusp? I know that <clears throat> on the cusp we'll, we'll right have now. To see how on the cusp, Spencer. I well, know Vincen- Vincen- Vincenzo. 
Vincenzo's got he's only his, one more. The next next guy up. No, um, Vincenzo, Mark, and oh, not Zahid. He took third. So Vincenzo right. and Mark are both this year. <clears throat> That's crazy. And then we've got who's That's on, Matt. Who's, Matt, think about that. Think about that, Matt. Penn State got eight NCAA finals appearance out of two guys. That's crazy. That's freaking crazy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that that's wild. Um, yeah, well, Yanni's obviously got two straight. Spencer's uh, got two straight. Two straight. Spencer could actually be only the second guy to win three state three straight at one twenty five. I thought I thought the statement was only three ever at one twenty five. I thought they no, said that uh, Stephen Stephen Adams was a three timer. Yeah. yeah, so I thought he was the only one to ever win three. That, that, that yeah. makes sense. Um, yeah, I I think that's it, Matt. Well, obviously, you know, it's only one year in, but Dayton Fix took second, so he has he has three more. He would have three more to go to get there. Um, and that that's it. No, oh wait. Well, Suriano's a two time finalist, right? Wait, Nolf, right? No, no, he's no no no, but he got four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second, first, or first. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. We got to talk about, we got, we got all distracted by wrestling history. Hopefully that didn't bore people too much. Tough, tough deal if it did. Oh, Mac, Makai Lewis is only out. He's got one of, of the four. Okay. Makai Lewis, red shirts. Um, and then we have Logan Massa, Olympic red shirting as well. So we have Vincenzo Marinelli. Wick McFadden coming down from 74. <clears throat> Isaiah Wade, Josh Shields, Bryce Steyart, uh, Demetri Shamero, Shane Griffith. I feel like with this weight class, Matt, um, there's a few matchups we've seen, but I think we, I just feel like we've seen all of these guys wrestle each other a lot. And um, so I think that, you know, makes it tough to see anything different than what has already happened. Um, you know, the one matchup we've never seen Wick and, and Vincenzo Joseph wrestle. Um, and then Wick, obviously. I'm, I'm Which is crazy, it. isn't it? Which, Which is crazy. We've never seen those guys wrestle. Yeah, because they've both been so highly ranked for their, you know, essentially their entire careers. The fact that they never met up once is kind of, kind of almost mind blowing. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. You know, there's so much familiarity with these guys when you, that you, that's what's up. That's what's surprising when you have four of the top five guys from the Big Ten wrestling in Big Ten dual meets, wrestling in the Big Ten tournament. It's amazing to me that that Joseph and Wick have never wrestled. That I'm that kind of blows my mind, actually. Yeah, um, it, it really is. I mean, so obviously wrestling a duel, Vincenzo's hurt last year, and then uh, at at the Big Tens. Um, Obviously, Marinelli got the win over Wick last year, so so that you know that the Chenzo and Wick didn't match up. Uh, hopefully, at some point this year they will. I know I know Penn State is coming to Wisconsin for a duel, I believe, in January. So we'll hopefully get a chance to get match up. Um, Wick, you know, obviously I get frustrated because the, the Wick Joseph uh, Wick Marinelli matchup happened three times last year, all of which Evan Wick lost by very narrow margins, all of which he rode him out for at least one of the periods, but was just not able to close the deal when he needed to. So, you know, for me, that's an interesting match. Obviously, I'm helping coach Wick, so I'm, you know, I can give him suggestions and, and pointers and, and stuff I think I can help him with to, to overcome Alex Marinelli. Um, I think David McFadden back down at this weight class is, is an interesting look. I think he's had success here before. I think he's good. Um Isaiah White is a guy who, um, Isaiah White is a guy who always is tough, but has not seemed to ever get over the hump. He's always going to be that guy that seems to be seems to land around fifth through eighth somewhere. Um, out of these top five guys, I don't really see him, you know, spoiling the party at the end of the year. I don't think he's that that guy. There's nothing there's nothing in his previous 3 years performances that would indicate like he's a serious title threat. There's no doubt he's 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 a podium guy. He's been a podium guy a couple times. But unless you can bring something to my attention, I can't recall of anything that led me to believe, "Oh yeah, this guy, he's in the mix." No, I th- I think uh, it's a three man race. I really think I I, I think it's a three man race. I, I you know I, I'd be Mc... willing to throw McFadden in there till proven otherwise. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna that was gonna be the 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 second part of my statement of the outside of those three, the one guy that could probably jump in there would, would be McFadden. 
that's not a huge statement. He's ranked number number four, right? Yeah. So no, not. yeah, but I, I agree with you about Isaiah White. I can't see him hopping in there. Josh Shields, you know, again, a guy who wrestles all these guys t- tight. Mm-hmm. So you could say the exact same thing about Bryce Steyer, but it's hard to see him over the hump. Um, Shane Griffith was really, really good as a redshirt last year. It'll be interesting to see how he um, pans out. But then as I look down through through the list beyond that. And again, maybe there's someone I'm missing who's who's not in the top 25 at this point. But there's no one. I'm like, wow, I could I could see that guy, you know, breaking the top four, breaking the top five. It just uh, I just don't see it as I'm moving down the list. So I think, yeah, I think it is a three, possibly four horse race. And then I also think that Shields, Steyart, Massa, and probably Dimitri Shmero, uh, Shane Griffith, they kind of create a, a nice little barrier there where it's going to be hard for some of those guys below them to beat them out. And so I think we kind of have a solid two tiers there, if that makes sense. No, I'd agree with you. Now I want to get into Wick because I, I really like, oh. I, I, I love Wick. Okay. Has he developed it? I, th- I really think, but it's difficult for me because I do have some rooting interests with Marinelli. He's, he's yeah. a, a St. Paris guy, say St. Paris Graham guy. Just a phenomenal. So uh, person. listen, I, I can I can say this. I think I can describe this without without giving away too many details, which I wouldn't want to do. Um, there. So what happened? This happens frequently. I've seen this happen with many guys besides Evan Wick. Um, what happens is that they come on to the scene as freshmen and they do a handful of things really, really, really well, right? Um, and especially, you know, he's unique because he's got a lot of length and he uses it well. And so they do a, a few things really well. If you kind of look back at, hey, Alex Marinelli and Evan Wick and the Constellations, their freshman year NCAs, he cradles them a bunch of times. And so then um, what happens as they become sophomores and older, everyone, all the best minds in the wrestling world are now scouting that person and saying, okay, he does this well, does this well, does this well. You cannot, you have to watch out for those things. Watch out for those things and you could, you know, just hold it close and beat them. So the second thing that changes about that is perception. When you're a nobody freshman, everybody thinks they're just going to come whip your ass. And they're not really thinking about strategy or, or anything else. Now, when you're this really, you know, Evan Wick took third as a freshman at NCAA, so now he's, you know, the number two, number three ranked guy as a sophomore. Now, everybody that wrestles him is thinking, oh my gosh, I'm wrestling number two or three ranked guy. All I need to do is hold it close with him. And maybe I can sneak one out at the end. But they're not thinking, oh, this is some freshman I'm just going to beat up. And, then, and so I've seen that happen with um, not just Evan, but a bunch of other people who have some type of uniqueness as a freshman and then struggle to gain momentum later. And it's not only because people are, are game playing for them, but it's also a, a perception type of thing. And so with him, I think um, hopefully he's added a few new wrinkles, which will surprise him. And, you know, the, the last thing there is there's not a, there's not a lot of room to go up. You you already ranked second or third. There's only these tiny incremental jumps to make. It's not like it's it, it, you know it's almost easier to go from twenty to eight than it is from two or three to one. Yeah, and I think in addition to what you were saying about Wick and and guys understanding what he does well, not only what he does well, everybody knows he cradles, but he's got a few tricks to get to his cradle, right? And it's yes. those specific mm-hmm. things. It's not the it's not the cradle itself. That's the obvious thing. But yes. there's a layer to that. Is like the tricks he uses to get into his cradle and to set you up and to bait yes. you into his cradle. And and I'm sure last year Evan heard that all the time from the coaching staff. It's like, hey oh, yeah. guys, guys are guys are focused on you. But I think what's equally as challenging as understanding that there's guys focusing on you and stopping your best position. It's hard to connect or really get breakthrough to a guy that had high level success. Yeah. Right? That's it's it. like, yeah. It's that famous saying, right? good is the, good's the enemy of great. Right. And it's like, wait a second. I, I placed high as a, as a freshman that yes. nobody could stop this. What do you mean? I've got to change it. What do I, what yes. do you mean? I got to adapt. Great I've had point, so Matt. much success and beat so many high level guys. Like, why do I need to change? And you almost need, you know, it's wrestlers typically are very stubborn, willful people. And it usually takes them getting punched in the mouth a few times and say, Oh uh, yeah. Hey coach, you're, you're, you're right. I, I do. Yes. I do need to change a little bit. Yep. I do need to adapt. Not that he has to go away from his cradle. He just probably needs to find new layers or new ways to get to it. Because, you know, once he gets his hands locked, that's 
you know, we we kind of coined it last year. That's terminal, right? Once he gets his <laughs> hands clock, you're, you're uh, in big time trouble. Terminal offense. That was that was good. Bo Nichols should have not been a dummy and signed with Rudis, and we could have made terminal offense shirts. <laughs> yes. Idiot. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, let's go to 157. We got uh, – man, when we talk about the last two weight classes, Matt, and not having a lot of people to be excited about, you know, freshmen to be excited about, this weight class has got some freshmen to be excited about. I am excited about Ja'Cory Teamer. I'm excited about David Carr. I'm excited about Will Luan. Uh, and they're all very, very far down the list at this point. Um, so I, I think that could, you know, that's always, I think for me, a lot of fun. We talk about like 165. We've almost seen all of those guys wrestle each other. For me, it's a lot more fun when we haven't seen these guys wrestle each other. You know, when we uh, when we get to say, well, how is this guy going to do? How's that guy going to match up with that guy? That that's so much more fun to me. So I'm I'm, I'm excited, very excited for this weight class. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. Um, and <clears throat> to your point, there's a lot of quality freshmen right now. I mean, if you look at the top ten, you're like, wow, that's surprisingly, again, surprisingly, I wouldn't consider this a a deep weight class, which is. Yes. How often have we when have we ever been able to say that about 157? I mean, that's the that's the yeah. wheelhouse. That's the traditional size of the majority of wrestlers. So the depth of talent consistently is typically there. Mm-hmm. And you you would think with you would kind of think with the graduation of Nolf and the dominance that he had for the last four years that you would see this rise in talent. And we don't really see that outside of you know Hidley and Deacon are the two guys that really jump jump off the screen at me. Well, yeah, I mean, um, Deacon, obviously, he, you know, he's a he's a puzzle because we've seen, you know, he lost a damn Caleb, um, Caleb Young two times at NCAAs last year, Matt, two times. Like, what, is, what in the heck happened there? Um, and I mean, we got a little bit then of he beat insight, James, But he beat cool. James Green from Matt Storniolo, right. sure. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, Matt Matthew gave us a little bit of insight about what what may have led to the dip in performance by Deacon at the end of last year, and then the preceding, you know, result at the the U.S. Open, him winning the U.S. Open, and what I know you pointed that question to him. It's like, how did that happen in the span of a month? Right? What it, seriously? It, it seemed to be just Deacon was a little bit overtrained. Yeah, a little I mean, bit was kind of coming from from Matthew. Um. Yeah, which yeah, is yeah. a really easy thing, and and it's and it, get, it more, people get beat down by the season. They they get in their own yeah. head about how long and how tough the season is, and then you know it, they essentially, in my opinion, wear on themselves because they just talk instead of having a, a you know more positive attitude about this process that they're going through. They talk about how difficult, how tough, how miserable it is, um, and that that bring kind of brings them down. And I know the one thing that Matthew was talking about with with Deacon, it it was like self-imposed overtraining. And it, and and Matt wasn't saying that to throw Deacon under the bus. This is a, a case for a lot of guys. They they do more than they actually should. Yeah. Um, they get workouts on their own that the coach isn't aware of uh, about, or they get extra drills in or extra runs in, thinking like they're so they're so consumed with winning a title and they see it within their grasp that they just overdo it. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's what it sounded like, you know, with, with Deacon at the end of the last year, a little bit of self-imposed overtraining and that's a maturity thing too. Right. I mean, yep. even though you hear those things repeatedly from your coach and we just kind of said it with Wick, Wick adapting and changing his technique um, to add new wrinkles into his game. It's a similar thing with you hear that from your coaches very, very often when you're young into college that, hey, you know, we've got to train smarter now. It's not just enough to train harder than everybody else. We have to train smarter than everybody else. And yes. when you've had success training harder than everybody else and being a superior talent like Deacon and probably doing the same thing his freshman year, without that wear and tear without the accumulation of the wear and tear. And yes. I think that's maybe something that people don't understand is like, yeah, as a freshman in college, you really haven't accumulated a lot of wear and tear. Even if you train really, really hard and you wrestle a highly competitive national schedule throughout the year, you don't accumulate that wear and tear. And so you think 
you can do the same thing when you go into college. And he did that his freshman year. He had success. And maybe for him, it wasn't adding a new wrinkle, but adding a new wrinkle in his training, adding a level of intelligence into his training and yeah. a level of maturity and understanding that, yeah, I do have to rest. I do have to recuperate. I do have to, you know, consider these things a little bit more than, than I would because I'm getting, I'm accumulating this gradual wear and tear. And it's, it's a hard thing to quantify Ben, right? Because yeah. it just kind of creeps up on you. Right. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I think you're totally right. I think <laughs> Like when you say Caleb Young could beat Hayden Hidley, I'm like, eh. But if you said Ryan Deke could beat Hayden Hidley, I, I wouldn't be all that shocked. I think, well, actually, did at US Open, correct? I wouldn't be all that shocked by that. Um, so yeah, I think I think you're saying all the right things for Ryan Deke. And um, now for him, it's 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 probably a little more simple than Matt. You just laid out a great outline there, but Matt <laughs> you, Ryan Deke doesn't have to just talk about it. Ryan Deke has got to be about it. He's got to actually execute on what you just said. Um, which is obviously always more difficult than saying it, right? Yeah, I'm smart. just some idiot behind a microphone. What do I know? Well, he's a, he's a smart kid. He could probably say it too, right? But then, you know, actually like, you know, going through the emotions of the ups and downs of the season and and doing exactly what you said is, um, like I said, it's it, it's ideal, It's but it's tough. And he's actually, you know, he's got to go and do that thing. Um, I don't know, is that, am I, am I on point there? No, I mean you're completely on on point. It's it's the old adage, easier said than done. I mean that's yes. why why the saying is taken. But well, let, let me ask you the way. Okay, I got no. I got another question for you, Matt, because I know okay. you're Penn. I know you're Penn State Homer. <laughs> um, everyone's getting really excited about Brady Bergen moving up a weight class, and they're saying he's going to have so much more offense because he's got more energy and blah 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 blah. And Matt, you know one thing I see out of guys who have notoriously cut a lot of weight is the style they wrestle is does not really change except they just gas out. And with Brady Berge, I just don't really see him being an offensive dino despite the fact that he's not cutting weight anymore. Um, do you think he's going to be a different guy at 49 or 57 than he is at, uh, was at 49? No, I, th- I think the best intentions will be there. And I think that's probably, we've, we've seen those guys in the room all the time. Like, and I think that's, where people are jumping and and assuming this could be the case. Well, it's the lack, you know, you take away the weight cut, we're going to see a completely different wrestler. And I think from a fan perspective and from a talent perspective, we see the evidence of talent, right? And Correct, it's probably yes. on full di- full display in the room. I can't speak to that because I haven't haven't been in there, but I bet that's on full display in the room and then just doesn't show up on the mat. We've we've seen guys like that. You probably had had teammates like that. Yep. I coached Absolutely. guys like that. They're like in the room, they're a national champ. Like, how do I how do I take the, the guy in the room, transfer under the lights? And if we can get yep. that, this guy watch out. But typically, like you said, I mean, if that guy is typically that guy, especially, you know, where he is. I mean, he's I think he's in his third year, right? He's a red shirt sophomore. Correct. Yep. Third year. Yeah. So typically yeah. you don't see big movements in their wrestling style after their second year. Yeah. I think you, I, I would, you see a lot of growth somewhere. and maturity in their first two years. After that, you kind of know what you're going to get. Yeah, so. Every once in a while you see it. You know, I'll actually I'll give you one guy, a guy you know really well that, at least this is an out, outsider's perspective, Matt, who made big jumps late in his career was Frank Molinaro. Um, he's the guy who made big jumps late in his career. And, uh, but yeah, geez, really? you're, uh, uh, well, I would, this is let's get outsider's perspective. When he was younger, I just kind of like I thought this is again this is what I thought of him um, that he was one of those high school Jersey kids who's really tough, who at the next level has some good wins, good few good things here and there, but is really really up and down, and probably you know will stick around that say seven to twelve level. Um, and so when he had the senior year that he had. I was like, I thought I was shocked by it. I, I did not think Frank Molinaro was going to be that good. That's a total outsider's perspective. He, yeah, I mean, he was in the finals the year before that. He was? And he was fifth, yeah. I mean, he was a four-time All-American. I think he was What? Se- now now you're making me look yeah. stupid. Are you sure he was a four-time I, All-American? Yeah. <laughs> I coached him. I, yes, I know. Are he you sure, man? Man, yes. are you sure? He, 
He placed as a true freshman. And that's probably where most people were making the assumption based off that true freshman year. He was 500 going into the NCAA tournament and ended up making it to the podium. But he, he was, he was a, a, a true freshman that was thrown in you know, to the Big Ten schedule. And so he, he was able to keep his head above water. Like he was able to, in spite of the 500 record, th- this is a guy like. Yeah, he had a 500 record. That's what, that's what, that's what yeah. I'm talking about, man. I think he was very but good. But that was his, that was his true freshman year. Okay, then he redshirted. And then I believe he went 5-2-1. Okay. Well, so, so that I, I'm wrong for today. I blew it. <laughs> Damn it. You could have probably uh, said anybody else in the country, and I wouldn't have known those things. So I would have just, I would have yeah, just yeah. probably agreed with you. But you school, you schooled me on that one. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so we we are we're hitting our time cap, man. You didn't think we were going to go? We're already overtime today. Uh, Fifty-seven. <laughs> I'm excited. I think Hidley's the favorite. Okay. I think what? What's up? May, we got to make our picks, and did we actually make our picks at sixty-five? We we didn't do it at sixty-five. Okay, go. Cool. Okay, so uh, who? who 65. I'll go Wick over Joseph. And I'm going Marinelli over Joseph. Ooh. Joseph, 1122. That'll be the only other person besides, uh, I don't recall who we just named. That was well. Uh, Pat Milkovich was 1122. All right. 149. Ooh, am I going to say something crazy here or am I going to pick someone? Ah, golly. I figure. Uh, is David Carr that is David Carr that good? If I'm not crazy, if I pick David Ooh, Carr or or you're going or, all or, the way there, huh? Or Jacory Teamer, I mean, both those guys. I am like so impressed by those guys. No, I'm I'm gonna be boring. I'm gonna go Hayden Hidley over Ryan Deacon. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be boring. I'll I'll do the same thing, but I'll reverse it. I mean, Deacon is a guy that we're both really impressed. He's a guy that I picked as to be the finalist against Nolf. There was never really a consideration that we thought he could win, but he was kind of. The guy that I thought was going to get to the finals all last year, I, I think he's going to right the ship this year, and I think he's going to win it against Hidley. Ooh, all right, good deal. All right, Matt, that's it for us. Next time you and I talk, I will be in Singapore. Uh, we'll be on opposite sides of the clock, but we're going to make some podcasts happen next week. So, I'll talk to you later. All right, safe travels. Peace.